Good evening. That's pretty good. I like that. Everybody survived Christmas? Yeah? <clears throat> Everybody have a good time with their families? Yeah? Any drama? Uh, at least somebody's honest. <laughs> My name's Adam. I'm uh, one of the pastors here. It's City on a Hill. It's, it's good to see everybody. I'm really excited that you're here. Um, Christmas was interesting for us. We went to back home to see my family. And uh, we get to see my family just every once in a while. Um, and, of course, there was, there, was, there was some drama. I don't know if you know my story. There was going to be some drama. I'll tell you about it if you, if you want to know. And uh, so I was, I was looking at this passage this week. Um, we're going to be in Exodus. And it was amazing to me about how God teaches us who he is and, and what he does and who we are and what we do through our experiences and through our circumstances and through the things that go on in our lives, whether they're good or bad or indifferent. See, it's interesting that, that, that God uses these circumstances versus maybe a textbook. Anybody go to college? Y'all went to college? How much do you remember from your textbooks? None of it. <laughs> I'm glad you're teaching our youth. <laughs> no, but the reality is, is when we go and we read a textbook, the majority of us maybe retain less than 30% of what we read, and that number dwindles over time. For me, it's like, you know, minutes to, no kidding, minutes. I forget what I read all the time. But experiences are something that, that, that we can grasp a hold of. Like if you can think about all of the experiences in your life over and over again, you can recall them with great detail. But you can't recall what the textbook says. And so while I was pondering or pontificating over, ooh, there you go. While I was pontificating over these current events that were happening in my family, I thought, Gosh, it's amazing how much over the course of the years I've matured and I've grown in how I deal with stressful situations, like family. Y'all are laughing like you know. And so that's where we're going to land today in our passage, is, is God is going to start showing His people He's basically to put them through the school of the hard knocks, right? Because the reality is, is that God has called each and every believer into a kingdom of priests. He's called each and every believer to preach the gospel to each other and to an outside world. He's called each and every believer to be a leader in the church. It's not just the person who got their Ph.D. in theology. It's not just the one who read the majority of the books. It's not just the one with the MDiv from Covenant, although all good things. It's each and every one of you. And through the Spirit and through our circumstances, He will continue to grow you and mature you. The big theological word for that is sanctify. As we grow and we look more like Christ. And so we're in the book of Exodus. If you have not been with us, let me give you a, a recap of what if, what's happened in Exodus. We started off with Israel, God's chosen people, and they're enslaved by Egypt. And God finally decides, Israel, you're going to come out of slavery and we said the slavery in Egypt was, looks like the slavery in our time, which is sin, the bondage of sin, the slavery of sin. And so God took two gentlemen who were not worthy to do anything and said, you're going to go tell Pharaoh, who was the king of the world at that point in time, to let my people go. And how did it go for them? Pharaoh said, no, you're not taking my 1.5 million slaves. Not today. And God said, that's fine. 
And so we looked over these plagues. And God released all of these plagues. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And the Israelites were, oh, you're going to go. Oh, you're not. Oh, you're going to go. Oh, you're not. And finally, we got to a point in which God said, fine. I will kill all of the firstborn of every family that doesn't have blood that's over their, their doorpost. A blood of an of, of a unblemished lamb. The blood of the, the perfect lamb that they had. And we talked about that. That was pushing us towards Jesus, right? That was a direct reflection to Jesus who died on the cross completely unblemished. Because all of the story has to do with Jesus. And then we talked about how the Israelites finally get to go. And they take off and they're going off and they're finally free from their slavery. And they get to the Red Sea and they turn around. And Pharaoh... And his armies are coming to get him. It's like the climax of the story. They finally get away, and they're, they're heading out, and they're going to God's promised land. And then all of a sudden, they hit the Red Sea. Where are we going to go, right or left? We can't figure it out. Pharaoh's behind us. And you got some cats that are like, hey, maybe we should fight them. 1.5 million peasants that have no training, no formal skills, and no weapons against the world's greatest army. Or maybe we can send a, swim across the Red Sea. Neither one of those options look too good to me. Amen? Tim might be able to swim across the Red Sea. That's it. And so God says, that's fine. I will open up the Red Sea. And so he opened up the Red Sea, and Israel walks through, and Pharaoh's army chases, and what happens? Bam, Red Sea closes on them, and the Israelites are looking at them, going, there's a lot of dead bodies here, but we're safe. Because God provides for his people. Which leads, which leads us to our big idea. And this is the framework that I want to look at this passage through today. God uses circumstances and experiences to show his glory and reveal to our hearts that He not only loves us, but provides for us in times of abundance and in times of need. He loves us, but provides and provides for us in times of abundance and of need. So we'll start Exodus Chapter 15, uh, verse 22, if you want to pull out your Bibles. It's a rather long passage like it has been in all of Exodus. And so I'm going to hit three major parts that will be up on the screen that I promise you I will stand in front of. But this one you can read. Or you can try to follow along in your Bibles. Some of you from the Baptist background will be able to catch up. Amen. I'm not Baptist, so I still don't get the joke, but I'm guessing there was some sort of like, what's that? Oh, they're all ahead. All ahead? Uh, sword drills, yeah, sword drills. We'll work on that. I don't know. All right, verse 22. God speaking through the letter of Moses while Moses is working it out. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. And therefore, it was named Marah. Slightly repetitive. And, God, and the people grumbled against Moses saying, What shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log. And he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule. And there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do what is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases that you put on Egypt, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were twelve springs of water and seventy palm trees. 
and they were encamped there by the water. So school of the hard knocks, this is the first test that God gives his people. They walk out into the barren desert. Let's get our, our minds wrapped around this. And they go three days and no water, and they start to get a little bit bitter. Now, when I first started reading this, I was like, y'all are some chumps, man. God just opened up the Red Sea. Like, you, are, you, are you serious? You're worried about water? The world's greatest army was just defeated by God who opened up the Red Sea and then crushed them, and you're worried about water and it being a little bitter. And then I got to thinking about some of my training. And there's a few things in this world that you can't live without. One of them happens to be water. In fact, three days without water and you're in a bad situation. It's a bad day. And so I started thinking to myself, I thought, you know what, three days, hot desert, wilderness, probably famished, because we were slaves, we weren't eating real well anyway, hard work, I'm going to give them some slack. I'm going to give them a little slack. But they were grumbling. And so our first look at where Jesus fits in this passage actually comes about halfway through. It's where God makes a covenant with his people. He says to them, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and give ear to his commandments and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Well, we're going to find out for the rest of the Bible that no one but one walked in all of the statutes of the Lord. No one but one diligently listened to the voice of the Lord and did what was right in His eyes. No one kept all of the commandments. No one but one. Now, if anyone in here is thinking, well, I do a pretty good job with my keeping of the commandments and listening and being diligent to the Lord, we only have to take a quick look through the book of James and find out that if you've broken one of the commandments, you've broken them all. It's sobering. It's sobering to think that there's a, a covenant here in which God says, if you do this diligently and if you do these things, then, then I am not going to put on the diseases of you that I did on the Egyptians were rough, right? There was gnats and frogs. Who wants gnats and frogs? And the locusts. Nobody wants locusts covering them. Pure darkness. And the death of the great destroyer that came. But there was one who did it. Jesus. And so today, church, if you're in the desert, or if you're feeling abundant, if you're, if you're here today, I want you to hear this. That God is a great God of healing. That He provides for His people. He provided His Son so that we wouldn't be judged on this covenant. That we would be judged on the new covenant. The covenant in which Jesus got on the cross. He died. His righteousness was relayed to us. And this water thing is going to become important here shortly. And then chapter 16 as we continue on. And they set out from Elam, and all of the congregation of the people of Israel came into the wilderness of sin. Let me run that back for you. All of the congregation and the people of Israel, that's, that's us as believers today, just in case we think that some of these points up into the New Testament and points to us are just made up, came to the wilderness of sin 
which is between Elam and Sinai, Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month, for they departed from the land of Egypt. So we've got some history there. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. So God frees them from Egypt. He shows them that He is God. He continually shows not only them, but everyone that's there. And what do they do? Grumble, grumble, grumble. Grumble, 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 like Oscar the Grouch. Nothing's good enough. I want you to run this back. Like, can you imagine that the Lord God frees you from slavery? You see all of these plagues go through. You see the death of the firstborn, but everybody that didn't have blood over the top of their doorpost. Then you walk out of slavery, knowing you're getting chased by a massive army, into the Red Sea in which it's opened and then collapsed on that massive army. God provides you some water that's not bitter. And you already start grumbling. I gave you a pass on the first test. This, this next test doesn't work. It's come on. And so they grumble against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by meat pots and ate bread to be full. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Verse 4. And then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk out in my law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all of the people of Israel, at evening you shall know it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall, shall, you shall see the glory of the Lord. That last little bit wasn't on there. And so God is out in the wilderness with his people who are hungry. And he, what's going to happen in the next bit of this passage is he's going to rain down bread called manna. And he's going to bring up quail so that they can eat because the manna they don't feel is good enough with food. And so what I want you to hear today, church, is that no matter where you are at in your life, no matter where you are at in your life, there is the bread of life for you. We're going to have communion today and we're going to break bread of life. Who is Jesus? There is nothing. There is no wilderness. There is no stranglehold. There is nothing in your life that you will go hungry for when you come to the table of Jesus. Because just like the Israelites who are out in the wilderness and they're going to take a long walk, God provides providentially. He provides sacrificially. He provides for each and every one of your needs. But ultimately, we have to recognize that there's a reliance on Him. Because if you notice in the story, it wasn't like the Israelites were out there and going and gathering all of this food. No, they're in their desert. There's no food. They're not going out to make their own bread. There is no bread. They're not going out to do anything. There is nothing in their lives that they can do that is going to bring them out of the wilderness or out of the bondages of sin. Nothing. Yet God provides them manna from heaven. And so if we take a look back into our time today, where did, what did God provide for us? What was the bread? 
was Jesus. Because just like we heard in that very first story, there was nothing that we could have done to save ourselves. Nothing. God is taking us to the school of the hard knocks. He's showing us ultimately that He is Lord and we are not. And in a day and an age where the world will tell us that you can do more and you can do great things and you can pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you can be the person that everybody looks to and your identity is in the things that you do and the things that you have. We just got out of a Christmas season in which we spend millions and millions of dollars, $40 billion is what was spent on, on Christmas to find something that satisfies us over and over and over again. We go to whatever we can, whether it's our jobs, whether it's our family, whether it's the gifts that we give, whether it's the gifts that we receive. It's how, whatever, whatever the thing is, there is nothing that will satisfy. Except one. Jesus. And so on the sixth day, we read in that passage that ultimately they were to gather two helpings of what they had. And the reason for that was the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath was a day that was set apart for God. It was a day in which you did no work. That you rested fully in Jesus. Now I've got to be honest, church. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. And they said they didn't Sabbath real well. And I thought to myself, oh man, I don't really Sabbath all that well either. Like really, I don't Sabbath all that well. I like to work. It's one of my things. In fact, it's so bad that uh, this week I haven't had to go to work because my boss told me that he didn't want to see my face because I had <clears throat> 18 days of PTO time that I hadn't used, just to give you a, a kind of an example of, of that. And so I started to think about it, started to process, like, why is it that I think that I have to continually do all of this work? Why, is, why, am, I, why am I so driven to this? And part, part of it is just I'm passionate about things. If anybody knows me, if, I, if I'm passionate about it, like I'm 100% about it. If I'm not passionate about it, I'm, I'm not 100% about it or 0%. Real talk. <laughs> but part of it is because ultimately I I feel like I have to prove myself. If I'm if I'm honest, who would be honest? Ultimately I, I feel like if I'm not gonna do it, then who's gonna do it? If I'm not going to work, then it's not gonna get done. So the reality is is, is my lack of Sabbath is because I want to be God. I want to be in control. I want to be the one that's looked at. I want the praise and I want the glory. And so it was a massive heart check. That I'm reading through this scripture and I'm, I'm blasting the Israelites in my head. Like, you dummies. Like, here's the God that's opened up the Red Sea and, and freed you from the bondage of slavery and, and has done all of these things. And then when you start to, to think about it and you start to walk that back through your lives, you start to think, who's the dummy? Because the reality is, is I know the rest of the story. I know that I've been saved. I know there's a one that's going to providentially provide for me. I know that there's a, a Lord in heaven. I know that Jesus died for my sins. I know that God loves His people and He's always there. I know that I don't have to be God. I know I've been given a new identity with a new family. I know all of these things. And yet, how quickly do I turn to me being God? 
Because ultimately, that's the heart check with our friends, the Israelites. They're grumbling and they're, they're irritated about this whole thing. It's, and they want to go back into slavery because at least they were working and they had some control of what they were getting. And that's the ruthless cycle of sin. Sin tells you from the very beginning that you can be like God. Little snake tells Eve, right? You can be like God. God, just just disobey God's commandments. Just disobey God's rules. Eat of the fruit. It's the same sin over and over and over again. And so what I want us to do today, church, as a congregation, start to think about those little things in our lives which God has commanded, like the Sabbath. and mull over those little things in which we're not faithful. Where we've let it slip. Where the gospel is not prevalent in those hearts. And then I encourage you to share it with somebody. I know every sermon I pretty much share some sort of repentance. It doesn't have to be you. But find somebody. Share it with the community so that you've got a You've got somebody to check you down. Hey, you're slipping a little bit here. Let me speak the gospel into your life. So then we'll start again on the third test. It may be the most glorious part of this passage. Chapter 17, verse 1. All of the congregation of the people of Israel moved from the wilderness of sin by stages according to the commandment of the Lord and camped in Rephidim. But there there was no water for the people to drink. And therefore the people quarreled with Moses. They're not grumbling anymore. They're quarreling. I guess that's fisticuffs. I'm not entirely sure what that is. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why do you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us, our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff in which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you, there on a rock in Horeb. And you shall strike the rock, and the water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massah. And Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people with Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? So it should be pretty apparent to us today that water is vastly important in the desert, and it's vastly important today. Y'all drank your eight cups of water today? I'm guessing that's a no. Most people are like, no? What are you talking about? Yeah? Good. I noticed that coffee and tea are also considered water. So I got plenty in my eight cups. I'm letting you know. Real talk. Come on. So we get this water, and we need it. We get this water, and we need it. It's important. And so there's an interesting point here that I want to make. In Egypt, when we were talking about all of the plagues, one thing that Tim mentioned in his sermon, which was true, is that each one, one thing was true. It's the one thing. Which was true is each one of those plagues was literally a throat chop into an Egyptian guy. 
Each one of them was pointed at an Egyptian god, and all of them were pointed at the Nile. Because the Nile was the source of life for all of Egypt. If you think about it, in the desert you have to have water for livestock. You have to have water for all of your, all of your fields and all of the people and all of those things. If that dries up, it's a bad day. I mean, it's a really bad day. In fact, Baal, if you continue on, was this God that get, continually gets worshipped over and over and over in the Old Testament. And Baal was the one that would appropriately control whether the, the rain came down or not. And God mocks him over and over again in some of the most prolific ways. So water's important. And there's some tie in between God and and water. And so in this passage, God tells Moses, look, these quarreling dudes, they're going to stone you, that's fine. Take that same staff which you struck the water. And what happened to that water? It turned to blood. That's right. That same staff that he struck the water turned the Nile into blood. It was one of the plagues. It was one of the more gruesome things. That God did, like that's that's a lot of water and that's a lot of blood. And he uses that same imagery in this passage and says, That's fine, I want you to go strike this rock. And out comes the water. But that rock wasn't just an ordinary rock. Was it? No. That rock was a foreshadow of one who was going to be struck. Because out of the rock sprang a lifeline. And we see those same words echoed when Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman, right? He says, I am the water. Whoever drinks of me will never be thirsty again. I am the wellspring of life. I am the rock that was going to be struck. I am the one that's going to be hit, and I am going to be the one that gets taken on the cross. I am the one, and out of the water that comes from me will be life, and you will be covered, and your iniquities will be covered, and your life will be mine. The Egyptians, the, the Egyptians didn't see it, and the Israelites see it, but we know the story. We know the story of where our life comes from because we can go to the sources of water that are in Egypt and we can go to the sources of water that are of this world and for a second they will give us a momentary pleasure. They will give us momentary feeling of life. It feels good to get a little bit of the sinful things in our lives but what happens is is we have to keep going back to them because they don't fulfill us. They won't bring us everlasting, eternal joy. What they give us is more and more debt of sin because we continually go after them and we turn to them as if they're gods, if they're going to give us our life. That's why massive amounts of people in America are chasing the American dream, which is a bust. You can't crawl your way to the top. And when you get to the top, there's always someone up higher than you. It's a reality. If your identity is in your work and you get fired, what happens? It's done. There goes your identity. If your identity is in a sports team, guess what? They're going to go through a losing patch. I'm a Huskers fan. It's been like 20 years. Remember that quarreling thing? Yeah, we're going to get at that. (laughs) But there's a reality, right? There is a reality that we will continue to go these things and we will look for them in pleasure. And that is what's going to ultimately define us and identify us. And when it goes away and when it ultimately doesn't fulfill our needs, we will turn and we will hate it. It's why our marriages get broken. It's why there's brokenness with our kids. It's why job satisfaction is so absolutely important. It's why we have so many people living in depression. It's cascading. 
And let me tell you a secret. It's sobering when you go back and you look at that whole Sabbath thing that I talked about earlier. And you start to think about this. You start to go, wow. If tomorrow I walk in and my boss says, hey, Adam, I'm sorry, but we don't need you anymore. Where am I going to turn? Am I going to turn to the one who gives me life? Am I going to turn to the one who providentially has provided for his people over and over and over again? Am I going to look to the cross and say, Jesus, I'm no longer just this, whatever my job title is this week. It's only a joke because it changes about once a month. Or am I going to look to the one who has given me an identity, who has given me a family, who has written eternity on my heart? 